Welcome to the AI Assisted Organization podcast with Implement AI. Your host is myself, Piers Linney. I'm a co founder of Implement AI, and my co host is Alok. Hi, Alok. How are you? My name is Alok Shukla. Another bonkers week. Absolutely insane, actually. So I think we're, we've got a lot to cover, but I think what I wanted to really go over today was I went to a, a Microsoft AI, quite senior AI partner event um, earlier in the week. And there's some interesting news from the video as well, and also what we've been up to as well. But I think there's, there's a huge amount that came out of this uh, Microsoft event. So not just what Microsoft is doing, but it was perspectives on the market, what large enterprises are doing, or what small companies should be thinking about as well. I just published an article on LinkedIn, um, and it's, it's under my own business as usual. And it's about and this thing about you know, large enterprises competing with small companies, and how is that going to play out? Because AI can solve for anything, essentially. So go and have a read of that. So this, this event was, um, it was hosted by the EMEA president of Microsoft and also the UK CEO, Claire Barkley, who I happen to know from um, back in the day when I was um, selling Microsoft cloud services. And had a lot of quite, quite large partners there. Um, so very honored for Implement AI to be invited myself. And they were kind of talking about and showcasing the Microsoft platform. So it's very much about, you know, Microsoft and OpenAI. And as you may or may or may not know, um, OpenAI you know, has got a $10 billion investment from Microsoft, which I think ownership goes up to, I think it's 49%. So it's a very, very close partnership there. And you've already seen in Bing that they've uh, integrated this. And now what they're really focusing on is co-pilots. So co-pilot is kind of your, your personal agent. So you probably remember, it depends how old you are, the old Microsoft paperclip. It's an annoying little character that popped up trying to help you. Well, this is obviously the next level. So the co-pilots, now there's already a co-pilot if you're a developer in, in GitHub. So this helps you to produce code. And increasingly, a lot of the code on GitHub is um, automated. It's been, it's been created by AI. Um, and yeah, it was quite interesting saying that Microsoft were... Everybody was talking about, you know, developers and how that's impacting developers. And they were saying that no one's really now going to need to learn the basics. You can kind of go straight into um, doing quite complex um, um, code. But no one really wanted to grapple with the point about, well, how do people come into the, how do you become a developer if you don't do the basics? So very interesting about the whole dynamics of the market and people sort of, not because of dancing around it, people don't know. So Microsoft got this very close relationship with OpenAI and they've, deployed on uh, their Azure platform. So Azure is Microsoft's um, large-scale cloud platform. It's a bit like Amazon AWS. They have a similar thing. Uh, Google Cloud have one as well. So my interest was always is these large language models, um, like ChatGPT is based on them, is that how do you implement that and deploy that in an organization? Because what you want is the capability. What you might not want is your company data transmitted back into somebody else's large language model. So it's there for other people to access, essentially. It's, a, it's a disaggregated, um, but it's there. And the, the chap who runs uh, Azure in the UK, who I've also known for quite a, lot, quite a few years, um, Mr. Wignall, he, he explained to me, I love the way he did it. He said, what we do, we dehydrate the platform, provide you the, a wall garden platform, and then you rehydrate it with your own data. So you get the capability but your data, but it's kind of in a wall garden, that, that, that training they've been doing, uh, Microsoft and OpenAI. And then you, you upload or ingest your corporate data or your customer data, and it's locked in. And, what you, and I was asking things like, well, can you use plugins? Because that's going to reach out, say, for example, to you know, do computational thing using Wolfram or you know, to book a flight using Expedia or to search the web or search other databases. And then it pulls that data back in and it's locked in. So there's no sort of in and out transmission of um, your private or customer data. And what was interesting, what really struck me in the meeting was that, you know, I've, I've been in cloud services for years and big companies always struggle with this stuff, inertia, process systems, regulation, you know, the cost of it, that other things to do. But that's not the case of AI. From the soundings I, I heard is that, large enterprises, even banks and, you know, financial services companies, they realize the power of this. They realize that there is an, an existential threat if they don't get their ducks in a row. No, indeed. It's an arms race, isn't it, right? Like, I mean, the thing is, when you've got this much power, this much capability, and you look at, like, the, like the, the announcements that have been coming, and you said yourself that Microsoft are really pushing really strong, powerful capabilities. And I think they were saying that even, like, the next week, the presentation will be out of date. 
like it's literally moving that quickly, isn't it? Like across across all the different elements that you that you guys have that you guys have got. Yeah, they, they talked about the the kind of platform and the security and how they have integrated infrastructure with these AI capabilities. But that that was a very good point. They even said, and I'll come on to I'll come on to the copilot in a minute. They even said that look, we apologise because you know one of my questions was how do we keep up with this? And they said, yeah, we know. How do we keep up with this <laughs> internally? And they said they apologised, saying this presentation will be out of date by the end of next week. And one of my 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 first question was um, to the big boss was how do you you know implement AI or other sort of um, services organisations? How do you you know, keep up to date for your clients. How do your how does a C suite then keep up to date with the organizational needs and how you deploy that? And how do even individual employees keep up with this capability that's being put in front of them? And you know, one of them is training. That's something we're going to be looking at and implement AI. Um, but the big one, the big demo they gave was the copilot. So this is the, the copilot going to be in Windows 11. Um, so it'll be one to help with your operating system. So trying to fix things, you know, that troubleshooter. It'll be like an, an, a GPT agent now. But the big one, though, is in Microsoft 365. And it's a game changer. I mean, this was, the example they gave was, right, no one's ever going to present with a blank sheet of paper anymore. I've got to do a presentation on this. So please do a presentation on, on this information and use my notes in this other file somewhere else, like in a OneNote document somewhere, and maybe do it in this style. So then creates this presentation for you. You can have another folder with, uh, you know, approved um, copyrighted images in there. It then applies those images. So it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be in perfect shape to go and give the, the pitch to a client maybe, but you're 60 to 70% of the way there. And that was in seconds. That was in minutes. And the big one, and we've looked at a code interpreter in chat GPT, was Excel. So you imagine, you know, it's, like, it's like Photoshop, isn't it? You know, I learned to, code, I learned to use Premiere Pro for video editing. Um, I'm okay. But it took me many, many hours. Photoshop, I didn't even bother. I thought, I haven't got the time to do this. You see, you know, in Adobe Fireflies, you can talk to Photoshop. Well, now you're going to be able to basically talk to Excel. And it was astounding. You can throw data in there. It'll assimilate it, try and understand it. You can then chop and change it, you know, pivot tables, the whole thing. Um, and that's going to change the way anybody and any organization can analyze data. No, 100%. And, and I think before... There was all about like different elements of data was in different places. Different employees had different capabilities to be able to look at it and understand it. And then what always happened was the people in the business units had the questions, but they didn't have the capability to analyze trends, discover different elements, because that would require a data scientist. Now what's happening is everybody has that power immediately. And I think the key thing that you said is that like there has to be a kind of structural plan. You don't really want your organization going on a free for all and everything going in different directions. So you almost want to like visioneer and say, OK, you know, like the tr classic horizons of like, you know, this year, you know, two years from now, five years from now, all of that's getting compressed. And you really need to think to yourself, OK, if we're an AI assisted organization in all of our departments, what does that look like? Who are we going to empower? How are we going to bring things forward? And then what does that capability look like? Because just like you said, Piers, like imagine you're launching a new business unit, a product within that business unit, and you need to get your press release, you need to get your brochureware, you need to get like your website, all that kind of stuff. Before that would have taken a long time to like ideate, script and, and, and organize. But if you've got in your walled garden all of your already approved materials, it can use that verbiage, that style, those elements. And so you can have very quickly something quite close to where you need to be. And then it just requires a couple of iterations and you're live. So your speed to market will increase, but this only works if you almost empower and focus your team members. So I think these it's very important to look at empowering your C-suite and also your team about, look, this is where we're going because you're getting on a roller coaster basically now. The thing to realize is you're stepping on a roller coaster. And when that roller coaster starts going up, it's not slowing down. So you need to kind of get everyone in the right seat to make sure that everybody's ready. Because once it starts, once you start going over that hill, and that's that's really these points of acceleration are really arising, that's where you, you've seen these big companies putting all their resources into it already, because they're gonna have the mass and, and the force to be able to like move much faster than they could ever be able to do before.
Well, yeah, we'll come on to talk about NVIDIA a little bit later. But you see, with NVIDIA, these large companies are really going hard at this and, and they're spending billions. But Microsoft had three horizons they talked about. And they're quite similar to the Implement AI horizon. So we had that, the, the human first world, which is kind of relevant now. The AI assisted world, which we're very focused on. And eventually, there'll be the, what we call the AI first world. And they had um, horizon one. They call it, you know, use cases where it's kind of, you know, chat GPT, people prompting it and it's kind of in the loop they called it the next horizon is where you allow the agents to interact with customers or systems without any human without any human involvement so there's no more human in the loop so that might be for example completely automated customer service or uh, until the point where there's a problem and maybe it gets escalated to a human that would that will be automated as well and then horizon three is really where it just disrupts all business models completely where you know the AI essentially is is solving and providing solutions for almost all aspects of the business. So they they see again we're in Horizon One, probably going to be in Horizon Two pretty quickly, and Horizon Three is kind of the game. Just what we call it AI first world. And then what they were the, the co-pilot. If you think about this, every employee and they've already got this. You can see it on the laptops. Um, they wouldn't let me. I wouldn't let me. I asked when could we get it, and they said, oh, "Well, we, we're still testing it." But imagine if you've seen the film Iron Man, and you probably hear this quite a lot. Jarvis, you know this this kind of what you call it. What is it like? A, an agent that helps him do stuff, and it speaks in English. Everybody's going to have a Jarvis. They're going to have a personal co-pilot, someone that's there to assist you. You might have one at work because it's obviously going to be in that wall garden. It's going to understand your corporate tone of voice. You might have one at home. It might be the one on your on your personal device or even your phone even, because that is coming, trust me. I mean, Apple, Apple haven't really announced much yet, but let's face it, it's coming. Uh, so everyone's going to have a Jarvis in the workplace, and that empowers people massively just to get more done. And uh, again, we're optimists. I think that there will be workloads that will not, no longer require human uh, interaction, and that's going to free up people to do hopefully more interesting things. I think over time, as we always talk about, there's the kind of the pyramid of value is going to get filled with technology, and the gap at the top is going to be for the more the more creative uh, innovate and the innovators. Um, but there's going to be few of them eventually. But that that's some way out. So these everyone's going to have a co-pilot. You're going to be able to get more work done, like you said. It could be very very quickly in your company tone of voice. What was interesting, a thought I had there was was that. If you imagine now, all your corporate data is in this kind of war garden and people have got these powerful tools to um, ask it questions, you've got to be very careful about permissions and who can see what data. Otherwise, someone can find out what everybody else is earning or you know, who your customers are and disappear with them. So there's lots of security issues. And what Microsoft said, which is, which is true, is that a lot of this requires these security wrappers and they're built onto these cloud platforms. So the issue is going to be is, you have to implement AI, but how do you do it? How do you do it cost effectively? And in some cases, the large players will have an advantage because initially it's going to cost over time, the cost will fall massively. Yeah, but, it, but it's all relative, isn't it, right? Because like, we, we're working with like two different sides of organization. We've been working with you know companies which are like you know up to 10 employees or even up to 50 employees. And then there's another one which is like nearly 500 employees, for example. And so the key thing is, is that like they both need... They can both benefit with a 30 to 50 percent performance increase but the thing is that they can also approach it in a different way if you've got 500 people in your organization you need to have your policies plan structure and strategy in place as quickly as possible that's what we're doing in these boardroom updates but if you're one of the smaller companies we've got some interesting um, conversations this week where you know they can really think about like okay maybe i'm a two-person organization and i want to stay a two-person organization i want to use ai to basically help me scale and, and gain gain more benefit from it. And you can absolutely do that. But again, it just requires that same level of clarity and thought about where you want to go to and, and, and how you're going to empower that. Because what's really interesting is like all of the old ways of developing software or you're building your own internal tools or different things like this, that's all out the window. And you've just got complete speed. I, I was playing around with um, some different um, spaces on, there's a, um, there's a place called Hug Hugging Face basically. And what they've got is lots of open source models and within there, you've got different spaces and different instances where you can actually see different open source models. And there's one um, Falcon model, for example, which has now been allowed with commercial use cases. 
and it's got very close to the capability of GPT and all those different other ones. And so you can also so you can see within there that like you talked about your own private instance. Some people might want to have their own like private and um, version of a model for like say medical applications or something like this. You can do that now. You know before. To do something like that, you'd need like, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions and stuff like that. You don't need like that big a budget to do those sorts of things now. And I, I was I loaded up and I was playing a little bit with that drag gun. You were talking about Photoshop. Did you, did you, we saw that demo which we gave on the um, that, that, that course we did a little bit where you literally just like take a photo yeah. of a person, point at like their nose and you just pull it. And then their face turns basically from the photo and it, and it reimagines all those different bits. So no, and, and I think the key word here, here is that like you was, we were talking offline before and you were saying like how, you know, that generally the bigger companies and like the lawyers and different people, they're like extremely hesitant and reticent to implement technology. But now it's an arms race. Basically, if you're, your competitors have got nuclear weapons, you need to have those different tools and those different capabilities as well so that your organization is not, you know, spending human labor to do something which someone else is doing very quickly and very easily so i think the key thing here is like everyone needs to up their up their speed speed of thinking speed of like planning and then you can then start to improve your speed of you know execution essentially and what also came out of it was again is you know a thought of had we had before but anything you do now your product is code and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's physical the way in which you create it, design it, deliver it, distribute it, analyze who your customers are, engage with them, it's code. And Microsoft said this, that even the banks now, it's taken them about two decades to realize this, but their product is code. So that's you got to think about the world. You had this, this concept of digital transformation that people have kind of, you know, sort of got on it. Some big organizations have tried to do it, but small, other small companies haven't. Now you have to, you have to, you have to literally transform a business. I don't care whether you're a local fish and chip shop or whether you're Amazon, it's the same thing. And a lot of these big companies, as you know, probably better than I do, you've been in it for quite a while. They've been, you know, working with machine learning, robotics for a long time. But this is not news to a lot of them. What the generative um, AI does means that there's a much easier way of now communicating. So very quickly, you know, code I think code will disappear into the background, essentially. You're just going to talk to things in natural language and say, go and do this for me or do this or create some code that makes this happen. And it will just happen. So I think the, I think the key thing is like before you'd use different SaaS softwares, which were like, like different companies would make different software tools for like different organizations or different use cases, like let's say an industry, like I don't know, let's say financial advisors or dental or vets or whatever. And if they had enough of those people that could make that piece of software and you've got that piece of software to solve your stuff, now you can just say, I've got these three different things and I want something that does this. And you can have that basically, right? So I think it becomes from like this almost like rigid world where these are the off the shelf options you've got. And if you want customization, it's horrendously expensive too. You can actually have what you want and you can do it in very nice light API front end, you know, like simple workflows, which can then do what you want to do. Because I think like literally as Jensen Wang from NVIDIA said is, everybody's a coder now isn't it right you know like i think the, the capabilities there is like natural language like the language is english or tamil or you know mandarin whatever it is right you know you can use that now to generate software and and, um, and outcomes essentially yeah another thought was was that like you just said that most SaaS, if you think if you think about a bell curve yeah everyone's you know nobody wants to do the outliers on each end everybody wants that big chunky big market in the middle a total obtainable market. So it tends to be, you know, the average. And then, you know, you'll have a a, a, sale, auto, a sales automation SaaS that then tries to do customer service, then tries to do something else. Or you've got the customer service one, tries to do the sales. Or then you've got a piece piece one together with another, and there's an API, and great things like Zapier allow you to do that. But in this new world, like you just said, you can basically just have your data, have your customers, and just talk to a, an interface and say, right, I need to find out in that data which customers look like this or need this. And then can you then, based on that, create a personalized email or personalized video, because I've seen that done this, this week, to send to each of them with this message. And hopefully this will be the conversion. And it will it'll drip those out. And as it gets feedback, it'll begin, it'll optimize the content and optimize to maximize that conversion. Now, no SaaS does that. You'd have to piece together four different ones and probably write some of your own code. And that is, it's so powerful. But people need to understand, you need to build in the skill set and the knowledge really into your business 
very quickly to understand where it's going. Example, I literally saw this week an API workflow where it was like to all abandoned carts, you know, like from Shopify or whatever it is like this, send a, you know, personalized video, exactly like you said, right? You know, and then if you've then got that running and then in parallel, you've also got like measurement of the open rate, you can then have, you know, an agent which would then say, okay, rewrite these op these um, subject lines to optimize the open rate. So you can have an agent which is almost doing conversion rate optimization on a monthly basis for you, you know, to kind of like just make your best better all the time. So I, I think the key thing here is you've just got to have the vision. So the, the question now is, how, how do you start thinking about it in this way? I had a very interesting um, call actually with, um, I mean, it was in government basically, right? And they were interested in understanding the applications of AI. And I was explaining that like, you know, there are many different elements that you have to think about a bit like colors. And these are colors that you can paint with. And if you didn't know that like violet or, you know, turquoise existed, you can't do that. And they were actually looking at like very complex data from multiple data systems. And they were trying to understand how they could uncover, um, let's call it, fraud or, or, or different opportunities from there. And I was explaining that like there's some different elements that you need to think about because you don't want to build a complex system with your own hard coded um, concepts of what fraud looks like because people are clever and people shift. And I was saying that like there's actually certain patterns and structures you can actually like put in place. And it came down to the point that like, look, it's better if we help you understand and show you in an update all the things that are possible, because you can then go offline and say, okay, we could look at this color, this color, this color, and then and then these these elements and work from there. But I think the key thing now is you've got to get your vision in gear and you've got to like start thinking about, okay, this transformation is here and how can we benefit from it basically? But the point, even in the, I mean, we're talking to government now, I, will, I was saying to you, check out the procurement process first. <laughs> so, but yeah, so what's fascinating about even government looking at this and the, and the large enterprise as well is that, you know, they get it. So they, they understand it and they are investing a huge amount of time and even people you've been talking to and, and money and energy into this. And the article I just uh, published on LinkedIn is really about, so if you imagine you've got, you know, large corporates, right? What are they? They've got customers, balance sheet, uh, market power, the capital, you know, they've got data, very important in AI. And these small companies, typically, I'm generalizing, they are your, you know, biotechs might be different, but they are your innovators. They could be local, let's personalize. Now, what AI does, it democratizes the ability to analyze any data, any customer, and create really custom and personalized products and services for them. So the interesting thought for me was, is that there's going to be almost like a, a battle for the middle, the middle piece, you know, and small companies never going to do the big things because they haven't got that capital and the distribution. And the big companies, they're going to be, yeah, they're going to be a local fish and ship shop. Having said that, cloud kitchens are disrupting that market. But that middle ground, the middle, that overlap is worth billions in any developed market. So I think there's going to be a huge fight for that. And platforms like Azure, Google Cloud, and the NVIDIA stuff, which let's go on to that, means that now the, the compute power is rapidly catching up um, to the, the needs of the, of the world that's using this stuff. No, completely. And, and I was, look, for NVIDIA, it's a good, the, the models that they've got um, and that the capability that's available now for, you know, drug discovery, sequencing, they were even talking about like now you could have your blood drawn and sequenced in the same visit and, and you know, different elements. And then even like for um, computer vision segmentation, I was looking at that. Honestly, do you know how much money it cost us to like, you know, label all of our visual data and then train neural networks, do segmentation? Like we had to pay for segmentation algorithms we made, which is basically cutting up a 3D image or, or photo into different elements. This is all free now and better than it ever was possible. So it's like these building blocks are just available for everyone that wants to implement their own. I mean, your creativity is not limited. There was a brilliant lecture by um, Andrew Ng where he talked about how AI can empower anybody. And he was talking about, for example, like any type of factory. And I remember a while ago seeing an example from Google where it was literally like a, a cucumber farmer. A cucumber farmer, like in Asia, was using computer vision to sort and filter, you know, different crops that were coming down the, the, the conveyor belt. And so you can actually do things, in, you just, you're just there with creativity now. The question is, if you can think of a use case and you can get it in place and start to benefit and profit from it, you're going to be in a different, you know, you, you've got different rules now, basically, compared to your or, other organizations that are thinking in a linear way, essentially. It's interesting that NVIDIA is like the, probably the biggest tech company that people haven't really heard of. Well, you may have heard of it if you're especially a gamer, but you don't really understand what it does. And I've learned a lot about NVIDIA this week, just in terms of, it, you know, it's kind of vertically integrated now. It's building, a, you know, it's got a CPU and a GPU built into one board now. So 
it's, it, they literally have probably, you know, I don't know how many years ahead of everyone else, but they kind of own that market. And I think they may not know where they are today, but they touched on being a trillion dollar company um, for half a day uh, this last week. So NVIDIA really has changed the game. And what he's saying is, uh, Jensen, he's the, the founder, he's saying, look, we, cause hardware, hardware was always second fiddle in a way, but now hardware is what allows the AI to actually happen. And he's now building out these sort of uh, pods and sort of like modulized sort of data centers where you can now, I mean, obviously it would cost a lot of money, but you can now build an AI supercomputer, whereas only governments or IBM could do this in the past. Now any large enterprise can do this. And now Microsoft is deploying this on the Azure platform so this, anyone can access it. So you're really offering this amazing software capability, LLMs, generative AI, with this huge infrastructure. Yeah, it's, it's basically like you, you imagine the three plugs, okay? You plug into the, the electricity, so you've got your computer on, right? You plug into the internet, so you've got access to the information. Now you plug into intelligence, and you can get whatever you want, basically. So there's literally those three plugs that you that all organizations now have access to, and that third plug of that plugging into like intelligence, super ability to interrogate and understand and recreate whatever you've got, that is there now. And I think really what I would encourage anyone to do is start thinking about, you know, like, what do you what what does best in class look like what is how high is high because you know this is where the opportunities lie over the next you know 12 months uh. and don't be afraid of video now because video very quickly uh, looking at nvidia's um services is going to become the norm you know you, you won't have you know static images that link to some youtube channel you can actually create video or even avatar well the amazing thing was in there as a quick aside is that he was sort of saying that now, like what we're doing now, or if you're on Zoom or Teams, is that you literally compress your video, send it over the internet as packets, and then you decompress the other side. And what there he's saying is that's a waste of energy and time and bandwidth. Just have a have a, a sort of an avatar of who you are, and then you send some data over the internet. And then the other side, there's an avatar, and it rep replicates your movements, and even does it in 3D, so you can see the side of your face. You're not actually sending video, you're just sending a, a, a persona, an avatar of yourself. All the differences, isn't it? Like, the differences in what actually happened, essentially. Yeah, because I was listening that, like, the way they're doing all these computers, that for every, like, one pixel, they're predicting another 15 or 16 changes and things like this, and I think... I think that's the, that's the key thing, really. I think this is where you need that fractional AI officer, and that's like one of the things that we provide. It's like you really need some to kind of engage with either yourself, get everything up to date, or engage with an organization where you can understand what are the capabilities because they're here now, and you can then think about how you can then transform your organization and map all that out, basically. Yeah, because a lot of organizations, I think I saw this in a meeting as well, is there's nobody in the organization, I don't care what size you yeah. are, really whose job and we said this last week as well to think about this and then some of the partners who help you know or your legacy managed service provider or a tech partner they don't really understand the technology quite yet or how you're going to use it so there's kind of a gap in the middle of this sort of knowledge gap which are bridged over time but you need to try and you know bridge that yourself as soon as possible so you're in a you're in it's quite sunny here i'm in london you're in lisbon but you're over this week, are you? So we've got some meetings. That's right, yeah, flying back over on Tuesday. We are now in the midst of talking to several companies of all sizes already, doing what we call AI boardroom updates and training. So the idea there is to level everybody up. Everybody needs to understand where this is going, it's like horizon scanning, the impact on the sector, the impact on your business potentially, um, the short-term things you should be thinking of. So governance is really important, that's, you know, policies, having an AI officer in some shape or form, we're doing fractional ones for now, um, and then building that all together. And then, then the next level is, which some I'm sure we'll go on to, is to looking into, right, what are the solutions, it's like a discovery um, sort of layer, discovery solutions, and how do you, what are the quick wins? And also, what are the big wins? What might be a large project where it completely transforms your business using this technology? Yeah. Yeah, your unfair advantage. Like one of the things that we I saw, and we've got some kind of conversations on that this week, and um, with some people, is that like we've been getting a deep dive into some of their processes, software they've used, and essentially friction points. And what's quite exciting is I think when you and I both look at these, we can see already like, oh, that you can you can do this here, you can do this here, you can do this here. Your capacity now becomes doubled, or your capability becomes you know much bigger. And I think when people can see that like, okay, I was on a path, let's say, of like this. And now I can be on a path of this. It becomes quite exciting and quite motivating. So I think the key thing here is like 
you need to think about it. You need to get a plan in place. And um, yeah, it's exciting times ahead. And these platforms, you know, you look at Microsoft, they're running as fast as they can at this. Google are trying to catch with Microsoft. The other companies that Apple have announcements to come. There is so much capability now and, and technology out there that you can embrace and deploy. And it's becoming cheaper, more accessible. It's becoming more democratized. Uh, these are exciting times. Indeed, Piers. Well, listen, always fascinating to catching up. We'll try and catch up in person next week as well. Until next week. So thanks for joining us. This is uh, Piers and Alok from Implement AI. If you want to find out more, go to implementai.io. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.